Welcome back to Dungeon Master Doom's reading of Elric of Mel... Mel... Oh, jeez. Melnibony. That's how you pronounce it. Melnibony. <laughs> this illustration is from one of the Elric comic books. This one is from 1985. They are very strange and bizarre comic books indeed. <laughs> well, I think it's time to begin chapter two. Let me turn on my orb and we shall begin. Chapter two, an upstart prince. He confronts his cousin. And how do you enjoy the ball, cousin? Elric asked, aware that Iracoon's melodramatic presentation had been designed to catch him off guard and, if possible, humiliate him. Is the music to your taste? Iracoon lowered his eyes and let his lips form a secret little smile. Everything is to my taste, my liege. But what of yourself? Does something displease you? You do not join the dance. Elric raised one pale finger to his chin and stared at Iracoon's hidden eyes. I enjoy the dance, cousin, nonetheless. Surely it is possible to take pleasure in the pleasure of others. Iracoon seemed genuinely astonished. His eyes opened fully and met Elric's. Elric felt a slight shock and then turned his own gaze away, indicating the music galleries with a languid hand. Or perhaps it is the pain of others which brings me pleasure. Fear not, for my sake, cousin, I am pleased. I am pleased. You may dance on, assured that your emperor enjoys the ball. But Iracoon was not to be diverted from his object. Surely, if his subjects are not to go away saddened and troubled that they have not pleased their ruler, the emperor should demonstrate his enjoyment. I would remind you, cousin, said Elric quietly, that the emperor has no duty to his subjects at all, save to rule them. Their duty is to him. That is the tradition of Melnibony. Iracoon had not expected Elric to use such arguments against him, but he rallied with his next retort. I agree, my lord. The emperor's duty is to rule his subjects. Perhaps that is why so many of them do not themselves enjoy the ball as much as they should. I do not follow you, cousin. Cimarill had risen and stood with her hands clenched on the step above her brother. She was tense and anxious, worried by her brother's bantering tone, his disdainful bearing. Iracoon, she said. He acknowledged her presence. Sister, I see you share our emperor's reluctance to dance. Iracoon, she murmured, you're going too far. The emperor is tolerant, but... Tolerant? Or is he careless? Is he careless of the traditions of our great race? Is he contemptuous of that race's pride? Devim Tobar was now mounting the steps. It was plain that he, too, sensed that Iracoon had chosen this moment to, to test 
Elric's power. Cimarron was aghast. She said urgently, Iracoon, if you would live, I would not care to live if the soul of Melnibony perished and the guardianship of our nation's soul is the responsibility of the emperor. And what if we should have an emperor who failed that responsibility, an emperor who was weak, an emperor who cared nothing for the greatness of the Dragon Isle and its folk? A hypothetical question, cousin. Elric had recovered his composure, and his voice was an icy drawl. For such an emperor has never sat upon the ruby throne, and such an emperor never shall. Divum Tovar came up, touching Iracun on the shoulder. Prince, if you value your dignity and your life. Elric raised his hand. There is no need for that, Divum Tovar. Prince Iracun merely entertains us with an intellectual debate. Fearing that I was bored by the music and the dance, which I am not, he thought he would provide the subject for a stimulating discourse. I am certain that we are most stimulated, Prince Iracun. Elric allowed a patronizing warmth to color his last sentence. Iracun flushed with anger and bit his lip. But go on, dear cousin, Iracun, Elric said. I am interested. Enlarge further on your argument. Iracun looked around him as if for support, but all his supporters were on the floor of the hall. Only Elric's friends, Divum Tovar and Cimarill, were nearby. Yet Iracun knew that his supporters were hearing every word, and that he would lose face if he did not retaliate. Elric could tell that Iracun would have preferred to have retired from this confrontation and choose another day and another ground on which to continue the battle. But that was not possible. Elric himself had no wish to continue the foolish banter which was no matter how disguised, a little better than the quarreling of two little girls over who should play with the slaves first. He decided to make an end to it. Irkun began, Then let me suggest that an emperor who was physically weak might also be weak in his rule as befitted. And Elric raised his hand. You have done enough, dear cousin, more than enough. You have wearied yourself with this conversation when you would have preferred to dance. I am touched by your concern, but now I, too, feel weariness steal upon me. Elric signaled for his old servant, Tanglebones, who stood on the far side of the throne dais amongst the soldiers. Tanglebones, my cloak! Elric stood up. I thank you again for your thoughtfulness, cousin. He addressed the court in general. I was entertained. Now I retire. Tanglebones brought the cloak of white fox fur and placed it around his master's shoulders. Tanglebones was very old and much taller than Elric, though his back was stooped, and his limbs seemed knotted and twisted back on themselves, like the limbs of a strong old tree. Elric walked across the dais and through the door which opened onto a corridor which led to his private apartments.